that the New Orleans Symphony folded on Thursday, September 12th, 1991. And I remember that date because I didn't find out about it until the following day when I saw it in the paper. And that was Friday the 13th. So I lost my job on Friday the 13th, which is why it, it, it sticks in my memory. I was new to the situation and I just kind of felt like that I had just basically packed up everything I had, moved it down there, and now it's gone, you know, and didn't know what was going to happen. My first season, I left my family when it was still the New Orleans Symphony, and I was alone in New Orleans. And I got home, packed up everything we owned, sold our house, and moved to New Orleans, signed a lease, and we're just starting to unpack when I got this news that uh, the New Orleans Symphony had folded. I remember meeting at the Union Hall on Esplanade Avenue. A number of people uh, mentioned that orchestras in uh, Denver and San Antonio had experimented with, with having a musician-run co-op model. And uh, we, we were wondering if that was something that, that might work in New Orleans too. And so there was a motion presented to uh, create a committee to explore the possibility of forming a co-op orchestra in New Orleans. And uh, I think like just about everybody else in the room uh, on that day, I remember raising my hand. And so that's, that's how I remember the start of the LPL. Uh, I remember the, the meetings that were sometimes contentious of, of all the musicians just sitting around trying to figure out how we could get it back up and running. And um, we were totally united in one purpose. We just refused to let the music die. We'd all just lost our jobs, which can be a devastating emotional experience, of course. But it's also very challenging financially. Uh, I know that in the early years, I was repeatedly having my utilities cut off because I just couldn't afford to pay them on time. So I'd come home, the electricity would be off, or my phone wouldn't be working because I, I hadn't paid the bill on time because I, I didn't have my, enough money in the bank to, to uh, pay for food and, and the utilities. Because the finances were so lean, I remember we would have parties where uh, I would maybe cook red beans and rice, and uh, that basically fed eight people, you know, and it was really great. And that and French bread, and then you add maybe maybe some some andouille sausage or something. But that wasn't that wasn't much money to feed eight people, and it tasted really good, you know. We didn't know what the heck we were doing. I mean. Uh, Patty Adams is, is a, a lovely person, and she's a wonderful musician, and she's also extremely talented with uh, visual and graphic arts. But at, at that time, she was, a, she was a piccolo player. She had no idea uh, how to, to run a marketing campaign for a symphony orchestra. She'd never done that before. Jim Atwood and, and Lee Beach uh, were percussionists. Neither of them had, had ever considered uh, managing payroll for 70 employees uh, on a weekly basis or uh, managing cash flow and budgeting for a million dollar uh, uh, nonprofit uh, arts organization. I remember at the beginning of the LPO, there were a lot of meetings trying to determine how are we going to divide up the workload uh, with the recognition that we were not gonna get, be getting paid anything additional to do that. One of the very first things I did um, as an extra job besides playing the viola was organizing a phone bank um, to sell subscriptions. So many people had such hard feelings about what had happened to the New Orleans Symphony. Uh, we had literally thousands of subscribers. Uh, these are the most loyal supporters of the orchestra in, in the community. Uh, they're people who bought tickets in advance because they really wanted to uh, come to our concerts. And not only were they not able to come to our concerts because the concerts were canceled, but uh, uh, they didn't even get their money back. And now you had some random musician calling you up on the phone and saying, hey, you want to spend some more money for some more hypothetical concerts that you may or may not uh, get to hear? And uh, people were understandably very skeptical about that, uh, as were government leaders, as were people in the community. There were a lot of businesses like uh, printers and uh, uh, ad agencies that had been stiffed by the New Orleans Symphony because they went bankrupt and, and they weren't able to collect their fees. Uh, and so doing business with, with some of those groups was very difficult uh, because we had to start our reputation out uh, uh, all over again. You were wearing many hats, you know, you weren't just playing your instrument, you weren't just trying to um, run the operations of the organization either. It was a combination of both. 
it was often difficult to feel like you could just be a musician um, who did some work for the orchestra on the side. Often I felt much more like I was a staff member, a management member who played the viola on the side, and that was not sustainable. Uh, we're trying to uh, run an orchestra with the musicians doing all the administrative uh, and uh, uh, governance uh, uh, aspects of the, the orchestra. And uh, that, that, there wasn't a, a, a clear model for exactly how to do that. And we were inventing stuff as, as we went along. So that was also very stressful. I remember after the Louisiana Philharmonic was first formed, there was this kind of frenetic energy to try to get a full-time orchestra up and running as quickly as possible. Uh, we all needed a job for one thing, and a lot of players were gonna just leave town if something didn't happen soon. And there were also, uh, a couple of other arts organizations in the area that were eager to fill the gap left when the New Orleans Symphony collapsed. And we weren't sure that was going to really be a good thing for us. So uh, we worked really hard and put together a short season that was going to start in January of 1992. And because people needed to see and hear an orchestra on stage before they could really um, buy into it, we put on this gala concert to be the debut of the Louisiana Philharmonic and also a chance to sell the subscription. Uh, that concert happened at the Sanger Theater on November 23rd. And that was, I think that was just two months after the orchestra started. At the very beginning, I did a lot of um, grunt work for the uh, marketing committee. I uh, put posters and flyers up all over town. And uh, there's actually a, a, a photo in the New Orleans Times Picayune showing me putting up a poster for the very first concert of the Louisiana Philharmonic. That concert was a, a gala concert called Scores Galore uh, to uh, raise money for the, to launch the new orchestra. And we must have put together hundreds of plastic champagne glasses for the reception that was going to follow our opening concert and stuffing the gift bags for the donors that went on every chair. We had to stuff these lanyard bags. <laughs> it was, there were thousands of these little uh, bags full of uh, trinkets. I have a picture I'll show you of uh, all the bags stacked out before the concert. You know, they, they had little, little things in them, little coupons, little, uh, at that time, Hershey's had just come out with a symphony bar and that was a great addition to put in just a little candy treat in this bag but you can imagine stuffing with tissue paper and all the little things that you put into a little tiny bag 2,000 of them it took a it took an army of people at a church out in Metairie. I remember those bags really well I don't remember everything that was in them but I do remember the most important thing was the season brochure was in every bag and I have one of these still and first of all when you look at it it's just really beautiful to look at the pictures and the layout and I think Patty Adams is responsible for for most of that. And then when you start to look at what the programs were, it was really impressive. We had six uh, classics concerts, three special events, a uh, family discovery series, a pop series, and um, really good artists, Maxim Shostakovich and Philippe Entremont, and all these artists donated their services to make this happen. Uh, you know, really all of this was created out of thin air by a bunch of musicians who had no experience running an orchestra, had no money, and just in about two months' time. And it's the result, really, of just a lot of hard work by some really talented and dedicated musicians. And thinking back on it, I'm, I'm really proud that I was part of that. And here I was on the opening night, and I'm actually dealing with um, ticketing, because I was in charge of ticketing, getting people their tickets and blah, blah, blah. And I remember looking at my watch and going, oh my God, I've got to play. And I ran out of the box office and ran down the side of the theater, walked on stage and had not warmed up whatsoever. And I was, and I literally, when I walked out on stage, said to myself, what are we playing? Like, I didn't remember what the repertoire was. And, and someone just said, here's your music. And they handed me a folder and I opened it up and like, oh yeah, okay, right. You know, and, and uh, that just would never happen today. And at the time, it almost seemed kind of normal. It was a huge success, and we sold a lot of subscriptions that night, got press coverage, and it really helped us take off. And I really think that if that concert had not been a success, if we hadn't sold enough tickets for it, 
or if there hadn't been press coverage or if something had gone really wrong, that that would have been the end. I don't think that we could have gone farther. And there were lots of things that could have gone wrong. I remember that uh, the really wonderful soprano Ruth Falcon was uh, going to sing on that performance. And a few days before, uh, we found out that her mother was very ill and she wasn't sure if she was going to even be able to sing and we weren't sure what we were going to do. And sadly, her mother passed away just a day or two before that performance and she wanted to go on. It really meant a lot to her and meant a lot to us that she sang anyway. That was an important moment. There, there were also so many places along the way where we just didn't really know what we were doing. I remember one case where uh, after the concert, we had this big envelope full of order forms. They all had checks attached or uh, credit card information on them. And I went to the Sanger box office with one or two other LPO members. And we had this meeting with them. We said, okay, look, we collected all this money. We're ready to turn this into tickets. What do we do? And it got really quiet in the room. And then one of them just said, this is not the way you do this. You know, you, you have to set up the box office first and then you sell the tickets. And we're like, oh, okay, we didn't know that. So what do we do now? And they said, well, we can't do this. You're sorry, it's not gonna work. And of course we weren't gonna just take no for an answer. And we talked to them for a while. I think they saw that we kind of knew what we were doing. And even though we kind of made a mistake uh, that, that maybe there's a way to work this out. And they started saying, okay, maybe we could do this or that. And we got it, obviously we got that worked out, but there were a lot of places like that where we just had to jump in and do the best we could and then kind of pick up the pieces later. I, I just remember the musicians having to do everything where before we, we practiced and we rehearsed and, you know, basically our only responsibility was playing our instruments. But um, when we formed the LPO, we had to sell tickets, find venues, find conductors, find uh, guest artists, do marketing, everything. And we would sometimes get a paycheck for $60 <laughs> for that week. It, it was hard, it was hard, but um, ultimately really rewarding. Uh, the, the very first year of the orchestra, we made, uh, uh, let's see, I got it here, I think it was, uh, yeah, three thousand six hundred and twenty dollars was that was that was all we made for the the, the first five month season from from January through May of ninety two. Um, so I know when I think back about those early experiences, I think I was on the orchestra committee very early on in my tenure there, uh, and probably wasn't additive at all. Uh, probably added absolutely no value, but I do remember sort of seeing the the personal dynamics, and uh, you know, and frankly, there were. There were great moments, but there were also real tensions. I mean, it was a, a exploratory kind of, uh, it was a real experiment, I think, in, in some ways in those early years. Um, and it helped me understand early on that there are always a lot of different points of view around issues. Um, and what you learn, you know, as you're in a leadership role, and I've learned this over the years, is that, um, you know, your job in some ways is to not always just pick one of those positions. It's to actually help people come around and, and build consensus around some kind of shared understanding. It doesn't mean that people will always agree, um, but it does mean that you have to have some sort of shared understanding about the direction going forward. And that's, that's something I think subconsciously I really took away from my experience at the LPO. Um, meetings would tend to uh, wander off topic and, and uh, go in strange directions. Uh, people, sometimes we even refer to them as, as like group therapy sessions because people would just be uh, bringing up uh, whatever happened to be on their mind that was upsetting them. And uh, the whole discussion would veer off the topic and sometimes get uh, personal and, and uh, uh, very awkward and, and uh, difficult. Um, back then, one of my hobbies was I used to referee or officiate high school football. And I did that for eight years. And um, one of the things that I thought was uh, necessary during some of those early meetings where we were, you know, battling with the idea of constructing this, this uh, organization and who would be in charge of this and where we should go, what directions and everything. Some of those meetings got very, very hot. You know, uh, some of the ideas were contested. And um, as an, a football official, I remember bringing a, a penalty flag a couple of times to some meetings and uh, 
you know, just um, secretly hiding it under the table, waiting, knowing that something probably was going to get out of hand. And then I'd pull it out and then uh, everybody would kind of laugh and that would kind of diffuse the, the tension and uh, which was the whole purpose. We often had very difficult orchestra meetings with a lot of voices and opinions aired. Um, I feel that ultimately we all came through and, and worked together and uh, made the right things happen. Uh, we needed to learn how to, to take minutes. Um, there were a lot of times when very difficult questions came up and, and we had uh, 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 long meetings and long uh, emotional discussions about a certain issue. And then we'd finally come to an agreement. Okay, this is what we're going to do. Except that everybody in the meeting would have a different memory of what that, what that was, what, what we'd agreed to. Um, if you want to look for a, a real unsung hero in the orchestra, uh, look at Bruce Owen and, and what he, he accomplished. He did a, an amazing job uh, um, as, as uh, the uh, minute taker for, for the orchestra. He went to all the meetings of all the different committees. And this must have been so frustrating for him to uh, be recording what everybody else said. And yet he didn't often, uh, often he didn't have a, a voice in the discussions himself, but he, he just uh, uh, worked so hard uh, putting detailed written minutes together. And that was a major... Uh, contribution to the orchestra. It meant that when we when we finally did agree on something, it was in writing and we could all go back to that and refer to that. No, on March 27th, we said this, we agreed to, 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 to this. Um, Bruce um, put all his minutes together in a, a newsletter, it was a, a weekly newsletter uh, called the LPO RAG. And I, I think uh, that, that contribution wasn't really appreciated. And I think it's it's important to recognize how much Bruce did for the orchestra just by writing stuff down and making sure that we remembered it. So when we were in the LPO, we were expected to step up as, as leaders of the organization and not just have a, a back seat. So that was an expectation. And, um, and so as uncomfortable as it felt at the time, like, what do I know about this? I just, you know, I, it's just me in a practice room with my flute. Um, I didn't learn this stuff in school, um, but uh, I, I, I've definitely used those tools uh, since. I feel like I got an appreciation for what real strong leadership looks like, or at least the kind of leadership that, that I came to appreciate uh, uh, in the LPO. It's not necessarily pounding your fist on the table or, or making a great inspiring speech, although I, I certainly saw people doing that in, in New Orleans. I miss the kind of input that we musicians got um, and were, were able to have into what the orchestra was doing. Um, of course, it meant a lot of extra work, but we had a control over the programming, over the image we presented, over things that you just don't get in other orchestras. And, and I also miss the part of that that meant I could get to know people from the audience, from the board, from the community in a way that, especially because I play in a pit orchestra now and I'm not even seen, I don't have that contact with the other people who are connected with the orchestra the way that we did in New Orleans. That was a nice thing about yeah. being a, a co-op orchestra, it's self-managed. In the, I think it was the third or fourth season, uh, Wendy Putnam, uh, was our concertmaster, and uh, she decided she wanted to uh, uh, create a co committee to uh, uh, help uh, support uh, musicians and make them feel better. And at first, they uh, put on some uh, receptions and, and stuff, and then that was that was nice. But then she got it into her head that we didn't have health insurance, and that was something that she could really do to help us out. And just basically single-handedly, she went around to all the insurance carriers in New Orleans and she negotiated with them. She saw who had which plans and uh, she uh, uh, managed to get a really good deal for us for, for health insurance. And um, that, was, that was just an amazing contribution she made. I was really fortunate to be in the right place at the right time for the starting of the Greater New Orleans Youth Orchestra. Uh, and a couple of my colleagues in the LPO served on that initial board with me. Those were uh, Bruce and Drew Owen. And that gave me the opportunity to do something else that I absolutely love, which is conducting. Part of my function with the Greater New Orleans Youth Orchestra also included eventually becoming the executive director. 
where I was able to really use the tools that I had learned serving in the finance committee and learn how to do things like writing grants and other things. I got to learn how, how an orchestra works, um, how committees work and how, um, how programs are put together, how money is raised, uh, how you can try to impact the community by what pieces you play or what soloist you bring in. I was only really involved uh, with, with uh, the, the executive committee for about two years. It was 93 through 95. But it, it turned out that, that those were really critical years, I, I think, for the orchestra, in that we were moving from kind of a week-to-week -week crisis management approach to thinking longer term and trying to see where the organization was going to go uh, on, a, on, a, on an ongoing basis. Um, the strategic plan was part of that. Uh, um, uh, improving our budgeting process was part of that. Uh, we also hired our first music director, Klaus Petter Zeibel, uh, during that time uh, when I was on the executive committee, and we hired a couple of new executive directors. Toward the end of the fourth season of the LPO, we began to look at changing the governance structure of the orchestra. Of course, up to that point, we had been totally a co-op orchestra, musician run and managed. And the executive committee of the orchestra was the legal board of directors. Now, we began to discuss changing that structure so that we would bring community members onto the board of directors executive committee. We had a couple of really great groups that had been working with us already with the symphony volunteers who had who ran fundraising events and were dedicated solely to raising money for the orchestra and of course we had a wonderful community advisory board made up of people who brought business expertise legal expertise but they didn't have any say in the day-to-day -day running of the orchestra or in hiring or the operations budget etc they were totally advisory we felt that if we could bring people onto the board in a more meaningful way, not just advisory, but offer them some feeling of ownership in the orchestra and perhaps in a greater feeling of fiduciary responsibility toward the orchestra, that we might be able to attract more of the people that we needed to help increase the funding for the orchestra. We ultimately first moved to a 50-50 split on the board, 50% uh, musicians, 50% community members, and then ultimately moved to a one-third musicians, two-thirds community members. Uh, we ended up adding uh, community members to the board uh, and, uh, and uh, slowly reestablishing ties with uh, people that had been supporters of the New Orleans Symphony and finding new people to, that would, would help because we all know that you need more than just musicians to make a professional orchestra. There, there was a very a wide range of activities that the orchestra did, and I, I miss that as well. I mean, uh, working with uh, people like Stevie Wonder uh, to Philippe Entremont and our, our playing for a Super Bowl. Those were all kind of very varied activities that, uh, that I think were maybe maybe unusual. And uh, because of the, the nature of the orchestra, you, you got to do things like that. It was very, very interesting. It was a joint concert uh, with the National Symphony. They were on tour and when they came to New Orleans, it was decided to make this a joint concert with the LPO, uh, where we sat side by side with uh, members of the National Symphony. Um, and the, the concert was conducted by uh, the famous cellist conductor Rostropovich, and it was a, a very special evening for, for myself and everyone involved. And so many It was really cool was the, um, the, the big opera gala we did for right after the hurricane with Denise Graves and Plaza Do Domingo and Nathan Gunn. That was, that was insane. And we got to, well, I don't know if we should say that we, um, we had all access pass. So we got to all over the arena. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, we went back into the Hornets <laughs> dressing or like the uh, locker room. I guess that's where it was in like the in the arena. It was pretty funny. Um, there was a special clarinet soloist coming into town to play the Copeland Clarinet Concerto. Um, the, the day of the concert, after the dress rehearsal, even the clarinetist 
got food poisoning and was at the hall ready to play the concert except that he was like you know sick in the bathroom unable to to really like do anything my friend chris pell who played principal clarinet right next to me in the orchestra um suddenly like gets up and, and is like i'll be right back it turns out he was backstage talking to carlos the music director and um some other folks and telling them you know what like this is really one of my favorite pieces i want to play this i want to play the performance so um so he, he convinces the the guys in charge like all right he's gonna do it and so he he comes out and plays the copeland clarinet concerto and of course like he just nailed it and like everybody loved it and i thought that was an amazing moment for the orchestra and uh, i thought that he he really like um put the orchestra in, in incredible light at that moment and also it's just so memorable one of the mementos from my time in the lpo that i keep around all the time i have it on my desk literally all the time um is the program from our Carnegie Hall appearance. Um, that was another really special moment for me. Uh, definitely a bucket list item that I don't know if I would ever be able to do without uh, my time at the LPO. But um, but yeah, you can see right here, Louisiana Philharmonic Orchestra. Um, it was, that was a very memorable and, and special um, evening and just the whole trip and everything around it was was the excitement and, Everything was just was incredible. So yeah, this is definitely uh, very near and dear to me. When I joined the orchestra in 1973, Werner Torkanowski was still the conductor. And I played through a variety of music directors, uh, Philippe Entremont, Leonard Slatkin, uh, Klaus-Peter Zeibel. And I did a little bit with Carlos. And I really missed that because it was my chance to continue practicing my Spanish. When we transformed into the Louisiana Philharmonic, well, there were, we didn't really have a music director at that time. We had many different guest conductors coming in. Probably one of the most special musical memories that I have was uh, working with Maxime Shostakovich, um, who was so, encouraging and supportive and inspiring to me at a very young age. Um, he really took me under his, his elbow. What's the word for that? <laughs> took me under his wing, took me under his wing. That's right. And, uh, and, um, you know, taught me a lot. Uh, Working with Max Shostakovich, uh, some of the people in the orchestra that would always try to get Max to talk <laughs> during rehearsals. Uh, Working with Philippe Entremont, um, Klaus Peter. But more than anything, I remember the music. Okay. The joy of sitting with my colleagues playing music. Well, I was on the marketing committee the, the first couple of years, and uh, I had worked in a record store in Chicago before I came down to New Orleans. And I had an idea that it would be uh, a really good idea to have a, uh, rec a record signing with a, a famous guest artist. And when Philippe Entremont, our former music director, came and uh, uh, agreed to conduct and, and play with the LPO in our first season, I thought this would be the perfect person to have uh, do a record signing. And so I scheduled this whole elaborate record signing at Tower Records uh, uh, downtown in Jack's Brewery. And uh, I got them to order wine and cheese, and I got them to order every CD in his catalog, hundreds of CDs. <clears throat> And I organized with his management for when the limo would get there and all that. And uh, we printed out these flyers, meet Philippe Entremont. I posted the, a few of those and everything. And in the end, it was a rainy day and nobody came. I mean, literally, they, there might have been one or two people who, who, who came to see Philippe Entremont. But it was just empty, except for a couple of musicians. I, I begged to, 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 to come uh, see Philippe and, and talk with him. He was a complete gentleman about the whole thing. He, 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 was, he acted as if nothing had gone wrong, but I was absolutely mortified. I do remember a lot of the great rehearsals that I had, uh, especially when uh, we have amazing conductors showed up and, and conduct the orchestra. I, you know, I don't have 
in one particular memory that was that really stands out and they're all really good they, 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 you know in general just anytime we were on stage with klaus peter it was the how the orchestra responded to him and how he could he could really just bring such a, a precise uh uh just mastery ma mastery is that a word yeah of of, of mm -hmm. just of the of the of the rhythm of the orchestra how everyone played together for him and played so passionately for him closer that i got uh one of the years that i was down there uh back when klaus peter zeibel was the music director and he actually signed it uh, oh. right from the bottom so and actually you know, uh, with the, the photo itself, or not the photo, the painting itself. Um, this was from, I think, that season, the artist, you know, rendition from whatever year that this uh, poster came out. And supposedly that's me right there. I don't know if you can see that, but I'm right there, third stand on the outside with my, with my crew cut. I do remember playing at the Sanger Theater. <laughs> and after having been in, in the Orpheum, just having to get used to the Sanger and how it sounded. Uh, I love getting into the Orpheum Theater. It had an interesting aroma that cannot be replaced anywhere else. I really enjoyed that. I miss playing at the, I miss playing concerts at the Orpheum Theater. I really loved that hall because it had a nice feeling of playing. You could hear each other and feel good about your tone. But the thing I really liked about it was you could look into the audience and you could see people. And after a while, people who had subscriptions, you would look in and you'd get to know people that you would recognize these faces in the audience that you actually can like say hi to them out there. I, I just I have one memory of playing a, a Dvorak symphony and looking out and I saw this woman just like tears in her eyes because she just was really taken away by the music and that's a kind of contact with the audience that you don't get in every orchestra hall. Uh, one of the most uh, impactful moments that uh, when I was there was when we re reopened the Orpheum Theater. Um, that and Mahler too. Um, even though I wasn't there before Katrina, um, before the Orpheum closed, um, it was still just one of the most emotional and powerful concerts that I've ever been involved with. It seemed like um, there were a lot of, I guess, kind of younger musicians who came around the same time. My very first rehearsal with the LPO, I was playing none other than the Porgy and Bess Overture. So when I finished and I saw musicians kind of turn around and look at me and I thought, no, I've totally blown this. So Carlos was finishing the phrase and he stopped and he said a few things and then he looks back at me with his big Carlos smile and I think he even stomped his foot and he's like, xylophone, that was fantastic. And then everyone shuffled their feet. And of course, then I just kind of took a breath and I just, you know, nodded my head. And I, um, I just remembered that A, everything was gonna be okay. And B, at that moment, I felt like I was home. LPO was my first time to actually get health insurance from Lang for an orchestra and it was the first time that I really got to be colleagues with people that were you know completely different generations than me. It for me it was my time with the LPO uh, um, was great musically classic with classical music but also uh, discovering New Orleans as an adult. Um, and then when I got to New Orleans, I never really had, uh, I, I didn't know how to drive really. I, I got my driver's license the day after I won the job and I drove straight from the airport to the DMV to get my license. Um, so 
learning how to drive and learn how to play in a professional orchestra and learn a brand new city all at the same time <laughs> was, um, was, was actually a lot of fun. Um, well, when I, <clears throat> when I played in New Orleans, when I first got there, I was pretty young. I was 20, 22 years old when I joined the orchestra. So I was straight out of, out of uh, the Eastman School of Music. And coming to New Orleans, I had I grew up in Champaign, Illinois, close to Chicago. I had never been further south than St. Louis. So going down to New Orleans was a really amazing experience for me, just culturally seeing such a different kind of city. I still consider New Orleans to be one of the most unique cities in North America. This is my first job, <laughs> and, um, and I'm in a really cool city. And also lucky to be playing in, you know, a venue such as the Orpheum Theater. This was my first full-time orchestra job uh, right out of New World Symphony. And so um, uh, I still had, I mean, we always have more to learn, that's for sure. I mean, but um, I really grew as a musician here playing in the, you know, in the orchestra and in the bass section. Uh, it was the first time uh, since I was five years old that I didn't have a, a private music teacher uh, to rely on. So it was, it was a time when, when I learned sort of what I needed to do, how I needed to practice to do my job as well as I could. It was, I, I was in my 20s. I started when I was 24, fresh out of school. And um, my best friend played second bassoon in the symphony already. Uh, so she'd been there for a year. And um, I remember getting there and feeling like I was really part of something um, really special and different. I knew it. I knew it to be different, even though it was my first real orchestra job. Um, but the community that I felt from uh, from all the different musicians and um, the talent and creativity and uh, leadership of these musicians was really inspiring. The independence with with like living in the city of New Orleans, um, the 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 chemistry that re that was reacting between me and the city was just it was amazing. Like I had never felt that you know I had never really had something of my own, and I really claimed New Orleans. Wow. Well, I think um, I I think I was twenty two when I showed up twenty one or twenty two when I showed up at the LPO. So. Um, when you're that age, you think you know something about how to play in an orchestra and don't. Um, and even when I left the LPO, I thought I knew something about running an orchestra and didn't. Um, but I, I think about those eight years as being personally incredibly important. I, I, I think like so many of us, I, I don't know that I really knew who I was. Um, I loved every minute of being in the LPO. I got there when I was right out of grad school. I was a baby. And I really did not have much experience playing in an orchestra. The LPO taught me how to be an orchestral musician. I just like became an adult. <laughs> you know, I became a professional musician playing in this orchestra. I mean, I, yes, I learned so much. I miss it a lot. It was great. I learned how to Mardi Gras. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been able to use that since though. You hear, oh God, that's a lot of beads. Yes. Nothing, uh, nothing illegal happened to get those beads. They were all given freely in uptown. <laughs> I loved Mardi Gras. Uh, that was, uh, I, I think I went to it every single year. The first year I only went to Crew de Boom. And um, that was the first time that I was publicly spanked. My second year on the job for Mardi Gras, um, we actually, uh, so a group of us in the orchestra and Carlos um, went and kind of marched um, before Rex, like on Mardi Gras day. So, you know, I got up at five in the morning on Mardi Gras day and, you know, wore my tux with sneakers, but wore my tux and brought a six pack of beer. Um, and we went and marched, you know, early in the morning, all, you know, through um, 
through the parade, um, it was pretty awesome. It was a lot of fun. Uh, there were a good amount of people from the orchestra uh, that were marching. And um, yeah, it was just a real fun time and not something I have done since, uh, you know, marching, marching in a parade. So. I think for me, it's the best food city I've ever lived in. I also miss the food in New Orleans. I remember um, good food, lots of good food there. You know, that's where my love of uh, food kind of like took a huge interest. I mean, I've always had an interest in food, but just, you know, just the history of food and music together, you know, uh, going hand in hand down in New Orleans. Was I was a vegetarian when I moved to New Orleans. Uh, which just really didn't work out very well. <laughs> and about kind of, you know, you'd go down and you'd order something like fettuccine Alfredo, but of course there were bits of boudin in there. And um, I finally just gave up and thought, I'm just going to miss out on too much food. <laughs> I, I miss the same things everybody else does. I miss the amazing food. I miss rabbit and sausage jambalaya at Coop's Place. I miss uh, oyster po' boys dressed at Don Melisa's. Obviously the food, gained a lot of pounds eating beignets after concerts. Um, I miss the food. <laughs> I became a serious foodie being in New Orleans and it's not the same in upstate New York. <laughs> One of the things I was very um, happy that we did as the education committee was Bob McGrath decided he wanted to come. She got Bob McGrath from Sesame Street to come do one of our educational concerts uh, for free. Uh, he agreed to, to donate his services so long as we, we provided the concerts for free to, to uh, uh, a lot of uh, New Orleans uh, kids. And we, I think we served something like 20,000 kids or something. It was a huge success. He's a wonderful artist uh, and uh, he uh, put on a great show. And, and I, I remember a story from them too, that uh, Bob McGrath, uh, he'd been doing this kids show all over the country with different orchestras all over America. And he said that he'd been doing this for years and years, but that New Orleans was the only place where the kids spontaneously clapped on two and four instead of on one and three, uh, which I, I think says a lot about the, uh, um, the, the uh, deep roots that, that uh, um, great music has in, in uh, the New Orleans area. One of my first rehearsals, driving home from the Orpheum down St. Charles Avenue. I used to live near um, Audubon Park, so I would drive down St. Charles Avenue, and, and I remember around 3.30, there were all these kids with trumpets and trombones and tubas coming home from school, and they were just playing their horns on the corner. And I remember I just stopped the car and pulled over and rolled the window down, and I just sat and listened to these kids playing their horns, and I thought, what a beautiful, what a beautiful city to have music just emanating from, from every street corner, and, and trumpet and brass in general was, a part of that language. Hey, Dodo's at Tipitina's on Sunday nights. Yeah. That was, there's nothing like that anywhere else. Followed, we know. followed by the dreaded Monday morning executive committee meeting. <laughs> but it was, it got me ready. In 2010, the LPO performed a benefit concert for the Mahalia Jackson Early Learning Center. And as part of that performance, I got to play with Ellis Marsalis, Delfeo Marsalis, and Wynton Marsalis's former drummer, Herlin Riley. Um, and there were so many other opportunities like that in my time in New Orleans that I got to, to play with some incredible musicians um, because of having been in the LPO. When we would play Pops concerts in New Orleans that involved some sort of a, a swing in brass section or whatever, um, everybody in the orchestra from having lived in, from, from being sort of immersed in all that, everyone had a really natural feel for, for that music. I've never been as satisfied uh, with how a group can feel jazz and swing the way they did in New Orleans compared to other orchestras. My wife and I, left New Orleans and moved to Syracuse, New York in 2002, uh, just a couple of years before Hurricane Katrina hit. And we were very grateful that uh, we weren't personally caught up in that, that terrible uh, disaster. But uh, we just felt awful about all of our friends and colleagues in New Orleans. 
And I remember making a lot of desperate uh, phone calls and sending out emails, trying to figure out how everybody was doing, if they were okay, uh, where they were in the country even. And uh, I remember being really freaked out when I uh, contacted uh, Jack Gardner, who was personnel manager at the time. And he, even Jack Gardner didn't know where everybody was. And if even Jack didn't know, you knew that things were in a total state of confusion. So when Hurricane Katrina hit, I had just finished my first season with the LPO. I hadn't even been with them for an entire season yet because I started in October. And we found out in August uh, what had happened and that we weren't going back. Like orchestras all across the country, I think, uh, the Syracuse Symphony really wanted to uh, help out uh, the musicians in New Orleans. And uh, we invited uh, some uh, LPO musicians to come play with us. Uh, John Riggs played with us for a week. Uh, um, Cheryl Frank uh, came and played viola with us, and uh, she actually, she and her husband moved back to uh, Rochester, New York, and so she, she became a regular sub with our orchestra for the, the next couple of years. Um, the musicians in Syracuse also uh, collected, I think, uh, two or three thousand dollars for the, the LPO Relief Fund, and uh, it was really amazing to see how uh, the LPO came back from, from Hurricane Katrina. It was really inspiring. One week after Katrina hit, I was on a plane to Hawaii to play with the Honolulu Symphony because orchestras all across the country were reaching out to the LPO musicians and inviting us to come and be part of their families for a week or longer sometimes. Some orchestra musicians, I believe, played several months with an orchestra. And so, you know, they were helping us out by giving us a paycheck and also inviting us into their families to make music with them. The Nashville Symphony invited us to come, the New York Philharmonic, uh, San Luis Obispo. And so the LPO musicians came from our homes, wherever we were, wherever we were sheltering and met up and we got to play music together. So it was a very emotional time uh, meeting up in these different cities to perform concerts and I'd only been with the orchestra for one year, but many of the mus musicians had been there for 20 plus years. And these people were really their family and they hadn't seen them in months because we weren't allowed back into New Orleans and we weren't playing together. And so to be able to come to these cities together and meet up in uh, different concert halls and share a meal together was pretty moving. And for me, especially as a new member to see the connections that were there uh, among the members of the orchestra who had been there for a long time was very special. So you don't really think about um, good things coming out of an event like Hurricane Katrina, but um, we had so many unique experiences that came about because of it. And one of them was playing with the New York Philharmonic. It's um, really one of the best orchestras in the country. Some would say the best. And as a result of uh, Katrina, we were all on stage with the New York Philharmonic playing a three-hour concert that was uh, broadcast nationally, I believe. And I was playing with uh, the principal clarinetist who I'd been watching on TV since I was a kid. So it was a pretty unique experience. The experience of Katrina really changed us and it was, it was, it was very much a heartbreaker for both of us to not be able to return to New Orleans with uh, with three babies, and it was just wasn't it just wasn't really feasible or possible, and 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 that regret is a tough word to to say, but but I do regret the time that that we would have spent with with the orchestra over the last few years, and I regret the 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 fact that we weren't able to go back and help rebuild the orchestra. I never wanted to leave the LPO. Uh, I kind of had to. Hurricane Katrina made New Orleans a terrible place for children, and I had two small children. Uh, it was very, very difficult for me to walk away from a job that I loved. After the hurricane, you know, we, our house had seven and a half feet of water, and um, I had just gotten organs removed because of cancer, and I was on chemotherapy. And I was just really, throw that I know, in. I know. Yeah, yeah. And uh, yeah, I was given, you know, months to live and uh, we had no home and we had nowhere to go, but we still wanted to play with the orchestra. And it was so very quickly revealed that Bruce Owen would just take us into his house 
and he as if we just had always lived there just opened his doors right to us and we had him and multiple people in the orchestra to say you know you can live here and then we came and lived with Bruce who was the best roommate I ever had so <laughs> so uh, that was a pretty special thing to have an orchestra where if you are lying in bed sick every day <laughs> and also just lost your house that you have somebody that says I have a good idea why don't your two dogs and you guys come and live with us <laughs> so it was pretty amazing Uh, there's just, it's such a special group of people. There's, um, and you know, the orchestra sounds amazing, but it's also just such a fun place to work. Uh, um, I really miss that. I just felt like I was friends with every single person in the orchestra and everybody had my back. I was very amazed at how appreciative in giving the orchestra was when I had my brain tumor. And it was very nice of them to do what they can or do what they did to pay attention to me and help me out. So my favorite thing about the LPO, I assumed all orchestras were like this and they are not. But as soon as you entered, I mean, the week that I was there, I was instantly family and everyone adopted me. And I felt, and even Matt, who wasn't even playing with the orchestra yet. He was still like bartending. He soon was playing with the orchestra, but it, they immediately were like, we need you to stay here. We need Matt to stay here. And I felt like I was coming home and I had just arrived. So, and every, like we'd go out to drinks after rehearsals. We'd go out for drinks after concerts. You would meet in people's backyards and have barbecues. And you knew what everybody's backyard looked like because everybody had you over. And, I loved playing in the orchestra. Uh, everybody was so sweet and they were my first real family outside of school. And uh, that, that was very hard to leave. I have not since then um, had a family like that for work. Um, I sat next to two incredibly special people row behind me were some amazing musicians and friends. And um, I think because of the way the LPO functions, um, you, you form a different kind of relationship and respect with your coworkers. Well, getting to play with Patty and Dean, of course, elevated my level of playing because of their wonderful musicianship and also just the other people in the wind section and string sections, the whole brass, everybody. You know, the, the bass section was certainly uh, just such a blast to hang out with and, and a great bunch of musicians. I really enjoyed that about the orchestra that year. So. Um, it was a really great, friendly bass section. I, in particular, remember uh, just a really collegial cello section. I really enjoyed that a lot. And Fondly, I remember Jack, Jack Gardner, who I sat next to for those 33 years some of the time on his right side and some of the time on his left side. And one of the most marvelous friendships, I don't think we ever had a bad word between us in those 33 years that we played next to each other. Uh, musically, uh, I, I learned an awful lot uh, playing with a great clarinet section with, with uh, Steve Cohen and John Reeks. Uh, we, we had a terrific section for, for about 10 years and we would play through uh, almost all the standard repertoire together. And, uh, I learned a lot from working with those guys, and, and uh, I, I uh, really appreciated that. We, we played a lot of great concerts. Many of us were so young and, frankly, a little wild. And I feel like I had this great opportunity to, to both do what I loved and wanted to do professionally, but also experience this amazing city and amazing culture. Matt Van Beesen, is he getting interviewed? <laughs> Yes, okay, so Matt used to give these uh, holiday parties and um, we would all dress up out of our regular black dress up. And um, it was always a fun time. I, I did learn a lot about playing in a wind section. Um, there was a lot of support for, for me as a new, new member and um, 
I just remember that we we were able to be a full section as as a wind section, um, while at the same time it was very encouraged. I felt um, to have a unique solo voice. Uh, so it was my very first day on the job, uh, and uh, I was nervous and excited, and you know really had practiced my part and was all ready to go. And arrived at the Orpheum Theater, and I was the first person on the stage, and I was setting up, and this crusty old guy walked in, and he said you don't know me, but I changed your diapers once. (laughs) And that was my introduction to Dicker, (laughs) Uh, who also happened to be my father's roommate when he joined the orchestra. Um, And then when my mom and he got married, uh, Dick was the one person that they trusted to kind of invite over to babysit. And Dick used to call me his little pelican. Hi. I miss the camaraderie that we developed over the years in in, uh, putting that whole thing together. There was a tremendous amount of pride in in what we accomplished. We were under uh, so much pressure and it was such a stressful situation that the the friendships that I made down there were, I think, were particularly intense and and long lasting. It's it's like we were all in the bunker together and uh, you saw people at their best Sometimes you saw people at their worst, and uh, there's something about uh, uh, being a, behind a cause altogether uh, and and really fighting for something that you believe in that, that uh, um, really uh, helps to uh, uh, draw you closer to people. And uh, I, I value that very much, and I, I value my friendships with, with uh, uh, all the people from the, the LPL. So I retired from the Louisiana Philharmonic after the short season of 2006. Currently, um, and I've been here for, this is my 17th season, um, the principal percussions in the uh, Philadelphia Orchestra. I left the LPO in 2002 when I won a principal clarinet position with the Syracuse Symphony in Syracuse, New York. And that was a great job. Uh, It was a very fine orchestra. Uh, But unfortunately, I went through my second orchestra bankruptcy when the Syracuse Symphony uh, got into financial difficulties and uh, folded in 2011. Uh, But once again, the musicians banded together and we formed another co-op orchestra called Symphoria. And we just uh, uh, finished our seventh season uh, this year. Um, I guess you could make a whole other documentary uh, about that story, but uh, I'd briefly like to say that, that uh, Symphoria took a lot of inspiration from the LPL, and uh, we, we uh, were inspired by the LPO story. We also got a lot of practical advice uh, looking at uh, LPO documents, uh, the LPO uh, bylaws and operating rules, the financial documents, uh, the committee structure. And uh, so uh, the LPO legacy uh, continues on in Syracuse as well. And I'm now playing principal trumpet with the Montreal Symphony Orchestra. I am currently the head orchestra director for the Belton School District in Central Texas. So now I am an attorney. I went back to law school and I'm practicing and living in Chapel Hill, North Carolina. But I still freelance occasionally. Well, now I live in Houston with my husband, Stephen, who is still a cellist with the ballet and the opera here in Houston. Um, I freelance and I teach at Sam Houston State University as an adjunct, which is up in Huntsville, Texas. I also teach as an adjunct at two junior colleges in the area. Um, I play principal flute in the Baytown Symphony and I'm the union contractor for that. And that's what I've been doing. I am a violinist in the Boston Symphony Orchestra. This is my 23rd season. So I've been playing uh, viola in the Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra, which is also the Washington National Opera Orchestra since I left New Orleans in 1998. Well, when we we moved to Washington, DC, um, I first, maybe 10 years, mainly what I was doing was uh, playing as an extra and 
National Symphony, the Washington National Opera, Baltimore Symphony. I started getting interested in magic again, which I had done as a, as a kid. And our, we have two kids and when they were small, I got interested in doing magic for their parties. And I eventually started my own business doing magic and I perform as the goofy wizard professor Liz Whiffle. Uh, I'm currently living in Port of Spain, Trinidad, where I am an assistant professor of double bass at the University of Trinidad and Tobago. I, I've had kind of a crazy time since I left the LPO, really. Uh, I left in early 2000. I went to Houston to work at the Houston Symphony, um, really in a kind of an artistic and production role, really a pretty junior role. Um, I hadn't had a job in orchestra administration before that point. Uh, spent the next, uh, I want to say, six or seven years there. Uh, and really rose through the ranks and actually found myself running the orchestra before I was all, uh, before it was over. Um, went to Melbourne, Australia to be the managing director for the Melbourne Symphony there, which was an amazing experience. And then while I was there, was approached about uh, uh, applying for the, the executive director and president role at the New York Philharmonic. So um, went there in 2012, did that for five years before I decided to uh, take a break from the, the orchestra business and uh, uh, start something new in terms of my career. But, um, well, now I'm currently the president of something called the University Musical Society, uh, based at the University of Michigan here in Ann Arbor, Michigan. Um, it's really been an incredible ride and I often talk about my beginnings and my career starting really thinking about orchestras and the performing arts and how we engage people. I think about that time at the LPO uh, very frequently. Currently, I teach at the University of Louisiana Lafayette, where I am the director of orchestral activities and professor of violin. I sadly left the orchestra in 2010 and I moved back to upstate New York um, to my hometown, which is very strange. And I got married. I have twin boys who are now seven, and I still freelance in the area, but I also have started a cake business called Sassy Cakes by Sue, and it's named after my golden retriever that I had while I was in New Orleans, Sassy. <laughs> she has sadly passed, but we now have another golden retriever named Mardi Gras. Uh, I live in Sarasota, Florida and I play with the Sarasota Orchestra and also with the, um, but I also um, gig around and play with, um, there's a lot of great orchestras around here. So I also play with the Florida Orchestra in Tampa and the Naples Philharmonic in Naples. So currently I am the section bassist in the Colorado Symphony Orchestra. I also um, am an instructor of double bass at the Lamont School of Music, the University of Denver. When I left New Orleans, uh, I got every other job that was not the Colorado Symphony. I played with the principal in Boulder Philharmonic. I got principal with Central City Opera during the summer, which I played 12 seasons up. I got into the Colorado Ballet Orchestra, which I have still do. Um, I was with a group called Boulder Acoustic Society, and we toured for a couple years. Uh, I am in Washington, D.C. now. I play with the Kennedy Center Opera House Orchestra slash Washington National Opera Orchestra, and I'm the Associate Concert Master. Now I'm uh, living in California and outside of uh, Los Angeles. I'm in Pasadena, and uh, I freelance, so I play with a lot of different orchestras. And I have a um, Etsy business, so I have an online um, felting business. Right now I'm a music faculty at uh, Salisbury University. That's part of the state system of Maryland. I'm a high school director in Texas, a uh, music director, so running an orchestra program. Go ahead. Right now we're uh, doing a lot of playing with the Richmond Symphony. Uh, I'm teaching at uh, the College of William and Mary. And uh, Teresa has a big old banging Suzuki studio at home. Yeah, I have a Suzuki studio and I play also in uh, lots of orchestras, um, Opera on the James and uh, Opera Williamsburg and um, Richmond Symphony and Williamsburg Symphony and things like that. <laughs> um, I'm, we are both freelancing in the Boston area. 
um, and we run a music studio um, out of our house and um, teaching in our local middle school and our high school as well. I'm currently associate professor of clarinet at the University of Memphis in Memphis, Tennessee. I am currently living in Colorado Springs, Colorado. I'm playing with the Colorado Springs Philharmonic. I play with Opera Colorado. I play with the Boulder Philharmonic. And in the summers, I play with the Central City Opera. Currently, I'm a member of the Oregon Symphony in Portland, Oregon. Uh, I've been playing third trumpet here since January of 2015. Right now, I live in Rochester, New York, and I play principal bassoon in the Rochester Philharmonic Orchestra. Yeah, so now um, I play bass with the Nashville Symphony Orchestra. Um, I play in the section there. I live in Cincinnati now, and I play with the Cincinnati Symphony Orchestra, playing principal clarinet. Right now, I am a member of the Colorado Symphony in Denver, uh, and I play fourth horn there. The LPO was a, was a, it was, I think, a necessary way to channel a lot of frustration, a lot of energy, a lot of excitement, and a lot of, um, you know, purpose in what I'm doing with my time. The New Orleans Symphony folded twice in a period of less than three years uh, before the Louisiana Philharmonic uh, rose from the ashes of the old organization to uh, create the, the 30 year legacy that, that we have now. And uh, even after Hurricane Katrina, nobody knew if, if New Orleans could come back, if, if the LPO could come back. And you came back even stronger than ever. You even, uh, you even renovated your hall. And uh, uh, it's, it's just been amazing to see uh, the success of the orchestra over the years.